to control uh, to uh, continue our treatment of gene regulation, uh, focusing on gene regulation in eukaryotes, um, we'll we'll be first talking about the regulation of eukaryotic gene expression at the transcriptional level, and this photograph here is a photograph of a chromosome from the salivary gland of a fly and what you see at this particular region is a puffing out of parts of the chromosomes. These are called chromosome puffs and those puffs are a response of the, the salivary gland cells in which these chromosomes are found to a particular hormone, a molting hormone called ecdysone. And what, ecdysone is a steroid hormone that uh, acts as a co uh, transcription factor along with its receptor to turn on particular target genes in the salivary gland nuclei. And what you can see is that genes in this particular area are puffed out, or the chromatin, I should say, is puffed out. And what that reflects is a, um, a decondensation of the chromatin of these genes, allowing the transcriptional machinery to uh, rapidly transcribe large numbers of mRNA messages from the, the target genes. And this brings up, this photograph actually brings up the uh, phenomenon of, of chromatin packaging and the ability of, of regulating chromat the state of chromatin to influence gene expression. And in point of fact, if we look at the um, relationship between chromatin packaging, so for, or DNA packaging and chromatin, if we look at DNA packaging states, DNA packaging levels, so we'll just say this is DNA packaging. Abbreviate that, DNA packaging. And we look at gene expression, GI, gene expression, or GE for gene expression rather, we find that there is an inverse correlation between these. Um, and in fact, once DNA is packaged beyond a certain point, it gene expression essentially drops down to, to close to zero. And that point is the point at which solenoid chromatin structure is formed. So if the chromatin achieves the packaging state beyond beads on a string chromatin, which consists of nucleosomes uh, connected by short linker DNAs, if we get to the solenoid state of chromatin, you may recall that from earlier treatments of chromatin, then uh, gene expression drops off to, to nothing. So gene expression drops off and genes are turned off. So that means that DNA packaging in chromatin, tightly packaged DNA will be inaccessible to uh, transcription factors which will, and RNA polymerase which could transcribe genes. So DNA packaging actually is a point at which regulation of eukaryotic gene transcription can occur. Now let's have a brief treatment of our um, of our nucleosome structure just to, to prime us for treating DNA packaging um, regulation. You'll remember from our earlier treatment of nucleosome structure that the nucleosome consists of, a single nucleosome consists of a histone octameric core shown in tan in Spaceville and DNA wrapped about 1.6 full turns around that histone core uh, shown with its sugar phosphate backbone in purple and the nitrogenous base in standard um, coloring, blue nitrogen, gray carbon, and red oxygen. And you may also re recall that in the histone core, there are eight, it's an octamer, so there are eight monomers, but there are two each of four different histone proteins. There are two monomers of H2A, shown in yellow, two of H2B, shown in red, and two of H3 in blue, and two of H4 in green. And in this structure of the protein, what has been resolved is the N-terminal tail of one of the monomers of histone 3. Now, it turns out that all of these monomers of histones actually have amino terminal tails that stick out from the nucleosome and actually uh, in, uh, are, are available for, for modification. So even though DNA is wrapped around the core of the histone, these N-terminal tails are available for modification. And they can be post-translationally modified, as we will see shortly. Now let's just look at the nucleosome structure briefly again to make sure we understand this. So DNA is wrapped about 1.65 turns around the nucleosome core. And basically that divides 
uh, that is about 146 base pairs of DNA. And if we divide that 146 base pair into two halves, there is a central uh, base pair that right in the middle that divides the wrapped DNA into two halves of, of about um, 72 base pairs and 73 base pairs respectively. So that single, that central base pair is shown in, is highlighted in red in this, in this view. And we can see that the DNA is wrapped around that nucleosome core and it associates tightly with the, with the positively charged histone proteins. Histones are positively charged and DNA has a negatively charged sugar phosphate backbone. And we can see the DNA wrapping around the nucleosome. So as you might expect, the post-translational modification of the N-terminal tails of the histone proteins can be a source of uh, regulation of the transcriptional availability of the DNA. And indeed, that post-translational modification is important in regulating eukaryotic gene transcription at the uh, uh, regulating gene expression at the transcriptional level. So looking at that transcriptional regulation in schematic uh, views, we see that, we remember that, as I've just said, solenoid structure packaging of chromatin, where histone H1 is involved in taking beads on a string chromatin consisting of nucleosomes linked together by short uh, linker DNAs. By taking that beads on a string chromatin and wrapping it into the 30 nanometer solenoid structure, that condensed solenoid structure blocks the access of transcription factors and RNA polymerase II on the promoter, and therefore blocks transcription. And if we look at an individual nucleosome uh, in, in schematic form here, we see the amino terminal tails that I've just referenced. And those amino tumor terminal tails of various histone proteins can be post-translationally modified. And one key post-translational modification is the addition of acetyl groups to histone tails, uh, shown schematically as green balls here. And there are particular residues, especially lysines, that are targets for a particular enzyme, a histone acetylase, that adds covalently tags these lysine residues in the N-terminal tails with acetate, with acetate groups, and acetate is a two-carbon organic molecule, as you will remember. So histone acetylase adds acetates to the N-terminal tails of histone proteins, and that addition renders the chromatin structure of, of um, regions of the genome in which acetylation has occurred, it renders that chromatin structure available for transcription of, of the DNA. Transcription factors that are important for turning genes on, and RNA polymerase, which obviously is essential to transcribe genes, have access to the DNA when chromatin is in this particular state. And acetylation of the, of the N-terminal tails of those proteins facilitate the achievement of that state. Now likewise, there are histone deacetylases, which remove acetates from the N-terminal tails, from key residues in the N-terminal tails of, of histones in nucleosomes, and thereby render the chromatin more susceptible to forming condensed solenoid structures and turning gene transcription off. So post-translational modification of, of histones in nucleosomes can be a point at which transcriptional regulation is achieved in eukaryotes. And there is also possible to modify post-replication um, post the DNA molecules by methylating uh, especially, um, especially uh, uh, cytosine residues. And cytosine methylation by DNA methylases also is associated with silencing of genes. So DNA methylation in eukaryotes uh, can silence genes. And that is a that uh, post-replication uh, modification of DNA uh, can affect the transcription of genes and can can thereby used to be used to negatively regulate transcription. Now it's time to turn to a mechanism of eukaryotic gene regulation that involves both regulation at the transcriptional level and the translational level. And this is a fairly recent discovery, and over the past two decades this has been worked out, this uh, pathway of regulation, and it involves a, uh, a pathway called 
RNAi, RNAi, which stands for RNA interference or RNA inhibition. And this, the discovery of this came about by uh, the notion that one could use complementary uh, RNAs to messenger RNAs for, for a particular gene to downregulate that gene in experimental contexts. For example, it was reasoned that if you have an mRNA for some gene, a gene of interest, so here is our messenger RNA some in the cell, and it was reasoned that if you could construct in vitro, artificially, a segment of RNA which was complementary to the messenger RNA coming from a particular gene, that you could generate through hydrogen bonding of complementary nitrogenous bases, that you could generate a region of double-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, that would block the translation of this messenger RNA because the ribosome that would be translating this messenger RNA into a peptide, into protein, would encounter um, this, this double-stranded RNA stretch, and that would block the progression of ribosome along the messenger RNA. That was the reasoning. Uh, and so people um, artificially introduced into cells uh, short stretches of single-stranded RNA that would be complementary to known uh, genes, uh, M messenger RNA. And indeed, initially they saw a knockdown of gene expression coming from targeted genes like this, targeted mRNAs. But later on, it was discovered that, in fact, you could inject um, double-stranded RNAs into cells. You could inject double-stranded RNAs, and this would serve knock down expression of a particular gene, a gene just as well as introducing single-stranded RNA, which would be complementary to the original RNA. And it soon became apparent that what was happening was the induction of a biochemical pathway called RNAi, or RNA interference. So let's see how that, um, how that works. First of all, um, if we have a messenger RNA here that is a target of, of our experiment, and we create a double-stranded stretch of RNA here by introducing a stretch of single-stranded mRNA that is complementary to a region of the messenger RNA, then what will happen is that um, a, a complex of proteins called RISC, which includes a protein called DICER, will bind to that double-stranded RNA, and chop it up into small segments. So we, the region of double-stranded RNA will be chopped up by, through the action of DICER into RNAs that we call small interfering RNAs. And these RNAs will then um, engage, be engaged by another key protein called argonaut. Uh, you may remember the myth mytholo mythological tales of Jason and the Argonauts. Well, the Argonaut protein, which is like a traveler, in other words, named after a traveler, a famous traveler, Jason and the Argonauts. So Argonaut protein um, comes in and binds these small interfering RNAs. This is Argonaut here. And what Argonaut does is it guides, and first of all, it, it gets rid of one of the two strands of the double-stranded RNA, of these small interfering RNAs and it guides the other RNA to messenger RNA to which it is complementary. And when it does that, it blocks, it does indeed block the translation of that messenger RNA. But this is a highly uh, uh, induced pathway. It's not simply that translation is blocked by the hybridization of one short stretch of RNA that is complementary to a messenger RNA to that messenger RNA. Rather, this is uh, these siRNAs are produced by DICER in quantity, and then Argonaut guides the uh, RNA, the small interfering RNA, back in back to the messenger RNA and binds to a region to which it is complementary. 
it would actually be, in this case, it would actually be over here. That's the original region of double-stranded RNA. And uh, it then can block translation, but Argonaut also has the ability to slice, and it will slice the messenger RNA, it will cut it. So Argonaut, uh, dicer is, a, is the dicer that produces SI RNA, and Argonaut is a slicer. It slices, we're dicing and slicing RNA here. It's, it is the slicer. It slices targeted messenger RNA, thereby just downregulating gene expression quite strongly. But interestingly enough, Argonaut also can take this uh, small interfering RNA and, take, and travel all the way back into the nucleus, if this is the nucleus here, from the cytoplasm, into the nucleus where it can um, anneal or, or find the complementary newly transcribed messenger RNAs or pre-messenger RNA coming from genes. And it can anneal there. And remembering that a gene is being transcribed into messenger RNA, it will anneal to that, the, the newly transcribed pre-messenger RNA. And when it does that, it recruits to the DNA chromatin remodeling factors. Chromatin remodeling factors. I'm abbreviating them as CRFs, chromatin remodeling factors, that cause the chromatin in the, this region of the genome that we're talking about, it causes that re, uh, the chromatin in that region to become heterochromatized or tightly packaged in solenoid or higher structures and thereby shuts down gene expression that way. So RNAi can downregulate gene expression by both blocking translation, we have translational regulation, translational regulation, but also transcriptional regulation. So we have transcriptional and translational downregulation through RNAi. Now at first this was thought to be a, the mechanism by which genes could be inhibited artificially in an experimental context. And it was thought that this pathway of RNAi, with, in which these very specific proteins are involved, may have evolved as a defense against double-stranded RNA viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. But it, it soon became apparent that although that could be an evolutionary origin of, biochemically speaking, of this pathway, it became clear that actually this pathway has been used to regulate genes uh, in eukaryotic organisms um, in, a, in, a, in this particular way. Um, and that is through the production of what we would call miRNAs. Now, uh, we know that RNAs can form double-stranded stretches uh, if they have complementary regions of nitrogenous bases that can form stem structures. We've encountered stems in several contexts. We've encountered them in transfer RNA, and we've encountered them in the SNRPs, the uh, small nuclear ribonucleoprotein RNAs that are involved in splicing. We have uh, also seen them in the uh, attenuation of uh, transcription in a prokaryotic context, the attenuation of the trip operon. So stem loop structures, uh, stems and, their, and loops that separate the stem um, strands are commonly found in R certain RNAs. And in the case of RNAi inhibition, the, this ability of RNAs to do this uh, it has uh, been shown to be an important uh, new uh, class of gene products. This has identified an important new class of gene products called miRNAs or microRNAs. And microRNAs are produced in the cell uh, by transcription of certain genes that are uh, RNA coding, and those RNAs can form stem loop structures shown here. And then th that induces the RNAi pathways to produce small um, SI RNAs or, that are digested into what we call M miRNAs or microRNAs. And those microRNAs, guided by the components of the RNAi pathway that we've already talked about, Dicer and Argonaut, they, those can be used to downregulate gene expression in ways that we've talked about, back, going back into the nucleus and, and heterochromatizing um, 
uh, regions of the genome that, and um, suppressing gene expression that way, epigenetically in other words, or uh, by silencing, tra uh, tr blocking transcription of, of mRNAs coming from target genes by, um, by slicing them or by blocking translation. So the entire RNA I, I pathway can come into play here. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that this isn't these double-stranded RNAs that are inducing the RNA I pathway and shutting down gene expression are not coming from exogenously applied sources from outside the cell or applied by an experimenter. These are coming from transcribed genes in the in the genome uh, that are look like they are designed specifically to produce double-stranded RNA that will produce uh, small RNAs that will be used by the RNAi pathway to inhibit the expression of particular genes. So that means there is complementarity between these genes that are transcribed that will eventually produce miRNAs and genes of interest that are, are being regulated, that are, are regulated. And some of these um, coding, the coding portions for these RNAs that will eventually feed the RNA, RNAi pathway and downregulate uh, target genes, some of those um, transcribed regions are, are actually found in introns of other genes. Uh, so introns can actually encode functional gene products. And when we talked about the role of, um, of introns, we hadn't mentioned that before, but it's appropriate to mention it now. So RNAi uh, and the production of miRNAs are an endogenous um, mechanism by which genes can be regulated, down-regulated in this case, at the translational level, but also at the transcriptional level through heterochromatization of regions of the genome surrounding uh, a gene that is being transcribed and for which there are small RNAs produced, um, miRNAs that are brought into the nucleus by Argonaut and um, recruit chromatin remodeling factors to regions of genes. So that is the RNAi pathway. And now we can end our discussion by, of um, RNA, um, a discussion of gene regulation of RNA by primarily looking at splicing and remembering that alternative RNAi, RNA splicing can produce different proteins. And so that regulation of splicing patterns of genes can allow the production of one particular um, protein in one type of cell and another particular protein come in another cell, all coming from the same uh, gene, encoded by the same gene, but with differential RNA splicing. And we've talked about differential RNA splicing previously, so I um, am not going to go into that now. So then we, if we look at eukaryotic gene expression, we see that there are a number of steps uh, that can be affected and, and whereby exertion of control of gene expression can happen. First of all, there's transcription, and transcription can be regulated in a number of ways. DNA can be methylated, silencing it. DNA can be highly packaged um, and, and thereby silenced uh, at the transcriptional level. What, uh, the, uh, the lack of positive activator transcription factors to bind enhancers can shut a gene down or alternatively the presence in cells, of, in certain cells, of tissue-specific or luxury activator auxiliary transcription factors binding to their enhancers can turn a gene on. So there are different ways to regulate gene expression at the transcriptional level, and we've talked about a lot of those. We have RNA splicing. Splicing factors can be produced. Splicing factor proteins can be produced that block particular splices and thereby promote other types of splices thereby regulating gene expression at the, at the splicing level, at the, at the RNA splicing uh, level. Their uh, export, the, in eukaryotes, the messenger RNA must be exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and that, can, that is a point at which regulation can occur. Um, uh, the, the, the efficiency for a particular mRNA of transport through the nuclear pores to the cytoplasm to be engaged by ribosomes can be altered. Then the expression of the gene that encodes that mRNA uh, can be altered. Uh, mRNA degradation by, through mechanisms that we've just considered, uh, DICER, for example, the RNAi pathway, or other pathways as well. Um, we know that poly-A tails 
are correlated with stability of mRNAs. So the length of polyadenylation can be used to regulate genes. Uh, translation, protein synthesis. If you can block a particular messenger RNA from being translated, then you can block gene expression. And in fact, we know in, in, of several instances in which specific proteins bind to particular mRNAs and provide a translational block for those mRNAs. And then at certain points uh, in development, they are, those translational blocks are released. The factors that are blocking translation of a particular mRNA are degraded, and the mRNA can indeed then be translated to produce proteins. And finally, we know that there is post-translational modification of gene products, of protein gene products. And we've considered, for example, the covalent modification of proteins that involve phosphorylation. When we talked about cellular signaling, we talked a lot about kinase cascades and the ability of protein activity to be regulated by the covalent attachment um, of, of phosphate groups to target serine or threonine or tyrosine residues by certain kinases. So the post-translational modifications can be, uh, of proteins can be very, a very important step of regulating gene expression. And if you consider gene expression to be a gene producing a product which is act functionally active, then for some proteins, uh, in some genes, they are not fully expressed until their protein product becomes post-translationally modified. Now, of course, we know that, that post-translational modification can also inhibit protein activity. We know that phosphorylation of the retinoblastoma protein, for example, if you go back to our cell cycle regu regulation, that's an example of, of phosphorylation that inhibits protein activity because retinoblastoma becomes inactive when it has, has been phosphorylated. So nevertheless, uh, we, we know that uh, post-translational modification of proteins can be a very important step at which genes are regulated. And finally, one last feature here is not post-translational modification, but post-translational degradation. And there is a protein called ubiquitin that can be covalently attached to proteins that are destined for destruction. And ATP is used in the, in the covalent linking of of ubiquitin polymers to a protein that will be targeted for destruction. And that happens in an organelle that we call the proteasome. This is a very large macromolecular assemblage. And proteins that have been ubiquinated pass through the proteasome and the peptide backbone is cleaved at various points in the proteasome so that polypeptide fragments are released, which can be further degraded and uh, releasing their amino acids to be recycled in the amino acid pool that can be used to charge new tRNAs or to be used in the biosynthesis of other compounds. And we know that um, the, it, it takes ATP energy to uh, ubiquinate, to, to polymerize ubiquitin and to then use u the enzyme ubiquitin ligase that will attach ubiquitin to targeted proteins that are, are destined to be destroyed. And then um, additional ubiquination can occur, and then that will target that protein for degradation in the proteasome. And just like the half-life of messenger RNA can affect gene products, in the, the presence of gene products in the cell, because if you have a half-life a half of a messenger RNA that is very short, when transcription of a gene is turned out off, the gene product will not last long in the cell, whereas a long-lived mRNA, uh, once the gene is transcribed, even when the gene stops being transcribed, that mRNA is capable of, being, of producing lots of gene product protein over, over a time period. Just like mRNA half-life can influence gene expression then, so can uh, protein half-life. Therefore, mRNA degradation and protein degradation are very important to consider as a regulatory steps in cells whereby gene expression can be affected. So that is our... Um, treatment of the control of gene expression. And um, for the remainder of the course, we're going to uh, be looking at a little bit of biotechnology and genomic uh, research. Uh, and then we will finish up by looking at, at, a, at a rather introductory level, the development of organisms, of multicellular organisms. So we'll be looking at the um, the ability of a single fertilized egg cell to give rise to all the cells in a multicellular organism, 
all the cells that have different functions. And that is a very um, interesting and elaborate process that involves intricate control of gene expression. So in a way, all your knowledge up to this point will be used to uh, will be used in our treatment of developmental biology. <laughs>